This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today, Art Collins. One of those voices, one of those mentors to me that has given me great pearls of wisdom over the year. He's even shared with me some very rare audio cassettes that I don't think he's shared with many other people. Art brings great insights across books like Market Beaters and Beating the Financial Futures Market. If I go through his market Beater's book, and just look at that table of contents, many guests that have appeared on this show, ranging from Robert Pardo, Larry Williams, Tom DeMarc, Mike Dever, and the legendary Bill Dunn, one of my all-time favorites. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Art Collins. So here's where I want to jump in, Art. I want to No, how you came to be a guy that people like Richard Dennis and Bill Dunn would trust you, would give you their time. These are not guys that have been widely quoted in the last 30 years. Early on in his career, Richard Dennis was quoted a lot, but he's been a little more reclusive. How did you, and this kind of opens up a big picture question about you as well, But how did you come to be this guy? And it's not just Rich Dennis and Bill Dunn, but from Bob Pardo to Mike Dever to Larry Williams, you've gone down a path. And look, you and I both have to pay homage to a guy like Jack Schwager because Jack has has done this stuff before you and I. But still, a lot of people like to go down the path where Rich Dennis and Bill Dunn give them their time. But you pulled that off. How did that happen? Never been asked that before. You know, I think maybe part of it is I'm not I'm not a purist as a journalist. I don't follow all those rules. I made the uh, interviews with these guys more of a partnership thing than an interview in that I let them go over what they had told me. I let Richard Dennis uh, see the uh, finished copy. You know, I, I knew that I would probably be sacrificing something in the way of objectivity, but, you know, these are not politicians. These are guys that, you know, I sort of assumed would be as honest as they could be about methodologies. I mean, why would they not be? Why would they be lying? I I wasn't asking them to show their accounts or anything that might be sensitive like that. I just wanted to know what was behind their methodologies and whatnot, so I didn't want to get anything wrong. I, I think they uh, they warmed up to that. Early on in this podcast, I had a couple of people that, I mean, I'm 500 plus episodes, a couple of people were asked for that too. And I granted it to them. They never asked for any edits. I don't know if it necessarily would cause one to say, well, that loses objectivity because frankly, if those guys want to get what they want to say as right, they get that opportunity because otherwise they're not going to talk. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. I mean, that's the reality. And then I think it just, it's just, you know, after people would uh, be exposed to my way of doing it, you know, they would they would speak highly of me to other people. So it's like... The trust happens. Yeah. Well, go back in time, though, because you did have a chance to spend some time with Rich Dennis. That was a highlight of my life, by the way. I, that guy's one of my idols. <laughs> you're going to have to, you're going to have to let the audience know. We're going to have to, you know, they're going to, they're going to live vicariously through you. So... Why don't you give that uh, impression as to the best that you can in that experience and perhaps even how it happened? I was friends with one of Richard Dennis' friends from the uh, Board of Trade. You know, I didn't want to impose on my friendship with this other individual, but I would constantly uh, make him aware that, you know, I was writing stuff and if he cared to share it with uh, Richard, that would be great type of thing. And he gave him uh, one of my books, my third book about mechanical system trading. And Richard called me up, said I enjoyed it. 
I said, great. I was thinking of writing another book on the subject. I said, would you like to do an interview? And he said, sure. And I fell off my couch. <laughs> I met him for dinner three times. I was riveted on his every word in a way that I've never been with another human being, I would say. What, is, what does he bring to the table that, that makes you feel that way? Because it's, I, I assume it's, look, you have great respect for him. You know about his history. But I assume also you were feeling immediately a presence that, that would make you say those words that you just said to me all those years later. It felt like we were two fans of trading on equal footing. <laughs> talking about it. it. It didn't feel like he was the tutor and I was the pupil, which of course was the case. But I, I would get enthused, warm up to a subject. He would be open with it. He wouldn't, you know, respond with monosyllables or anything. I seem to, I seem to be talking his language, you know. I don't know if this sounds immodest or not, but we, we seem like baseball fans or something, comparing notes on the subject. What do you think, though, you took away in terms of from that experience that you say the one of the highlights of your life? What was the highlight? What was the thing that he did or said that for you was like, ah, oh, wow, I just love it? I think when we talked about methodologies, he was talking, I asked him, you know, we all, those of us in the industry are all pretty familiar with his, the trading that made him famous buying the highest high of X number of days, selling the lowest low, momentum following, basically, is what he was doing, which is, of course, your forte. And I asked him, because, you know, a lot of his pupils, the Turtles, had gone on and were doing lectures on the subject and getting followings on their own. I just wondered, you know, are these methods still effective? And he basically said, I don't think that anything that was working back then is particularly effective now. And he talked about some new ideas without, you know, divulging exactly what he was doing. But I, I love the concept of them. You know, if I were, he said, if I were to buy something now, I would wait till a wave was on the downside before I would buy, you know, within the wave, something like that. I'm, I know I'm not doing it justice, but when he was telling it to me, it was making sense in my head. And I was like, this guy, you know, just thinks outside the box. Just phenomenal. You know, he's, he's an individual, he's a pioneer, and he's just brilliant. Let me ask you for some clarification there, because the audience out there, I, I know how you're talking, and you're not attempting as a guy who knows very well what trend following is, and you've talked to many of them, and, you know, about systematic trading. But with that expression of what you just said, you know, when you're talking about some of the, the early turtle principles, uh, rules, you, I, you might want to clarify for the audience, because for example, trend following hasn't stopped. Everyone should have a stop. Some of the things we're going to talk about today, not taking a profit. I mean, some of those, those big picture principles, you know, philosophies that he taught the turtles, those haven't changed. It sounds like maybe you were talking about nuances and things on the edge or or was he saying that from his perspective trend following at the time that you talked to him that he did not think trend following was going to continue to work no i don't you know i think you're right i don't think the whole macro approach was changing i think he was saying that you know the fine points of it were different and he also told me this i think this was like in 2005 and he predicted that markets were going to get volatile again and we'd all be happy with trend following thereafter and it was proven right it's the ebb and flow right i mean it's it's hey why don't you go back in time though even further here so you know a guy who a cbot member chicago board of trade member how did this start how did art collins start how did you first make it onto a trading floor it's so weird because even though i've lived outside chicago my whole life i had no idea what futures were I had no idea that there existed these exchanges or, or what they meant or anything. In my early 20s, I was a blackjack card counter. And I would go to Vegas frequently with my father, who was also into gambling, uh, and another friend of mine who later became a trading partner. And we're sitting together in Vegas, and, and my dad was talking about futures trading. And at the time, I was working in his business. He owned a car agency, and I was not enjoying it at all. It was like, 
in, in retrospect, the opposite of everything trading was. You know, your time was not your own. You were working horrible hours. You were not responsible for your own, your own uh, success. You were at the mercy of customers. You were at the mercy of managers, bankers, government regulations. I mean, it went on and on. And he told me about <laughs> this situation where you could go down, you know, he was talking about grain trading, work from 9.30 in the morning to 1.15 in the afternoon. Well, that 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 piqued my interest right off the bat and then it was like oh you're trading for yourself no one cares if you're there but what do you mean well what if i have to call in sick you know (laughs) you know it's just i was totally ignorant got into it you know went to classes and whatnot and then just started trading like most everybody just firing off trades from the gut seat of the pants and losing almost every time and i'm like you know if a market can only go up or down why am i always losing you would think of you know throwing a dart would get me right half the time and then i went to a lecture uh, by uh, larry williams and jake bernstein about mechanical trading that's when the light bulb went off give me a year on this art roughly we are that was uh, 1986 right in the heyday uh, must have been early in 86, and I, I went to the library. I was looking to discover something in the grains, which is, uh, I had a mid amp seat, then I was going down and trading in the wheat pit. Couldn't find anything, and I should mention, uh, in the library, I was looking at microfish. I had to go through the Wall Street Journal and and, and just, just you know, scan through this, looking for the uh, commodity page. Very, very <laughs> laborious process, but this is kind of how I succeeded because, you know, it didn't bother me to be doing this. I was just hooked on, you know, discovering the solution to this puzzle. So my my eyes kind of drifted to the T-bonds, the 30-year bonds, and I noticed that if they opened in a basis point that was different from the one they closed in and then moved back into the original basis point, you'd want to go with that move and hold it overnight. And then I used the trick I learned from Larry Williams in that lecture of the next day trying to get out of a long at the previous day's high and a short at the previous day's low. You know, he, he presented that under uh, buy the high, sell the low of the day. It was kind of a clever buy, excuse me, I got that backward, of course. Buy the low, sell the high of the day. That's how you did it. It was just yesterday you were doing that in a trade you were already in. It was, you know, it was a system that started making me money right off the bat, and then that just fed on itself, and I was always in research after that. I invented uh, my second system, an S&P system, one month before Black Monday hit, and it got me short, and I made a windfall like five times what I'd ever made, and... The, the, the rest is history for me. Let me bring you up to current, though, a little bit. So if you look back to that particular uh, Black Monday and that S&P system, having a quant system that is only on one market with without the diversification, walk that through with the audience. Because if if you don't have the diversification, you don't have the opportunity. If you only have one market things, the risk by just simple math kind of increases there. So so do you look at your Black Monday experience as even though the system got you out or short, do you look at it as a a certain amount of luck since your diversification was the one market? Absolutely. Because years later, I came in wrong, you know, just before 9-11. And I always tell people in uh, in researching a system, when you get your uh, performance summary, you want to make sure that it's not coming from a little narrow area in your data field. You know, if something is uh, making a hundred thousand dollars in your history, but eighty five percent of the profits were in and around a market crash, that's meaningless because the next time you could just as easily be wrong as right. An individual trade means nothing, as you know. You know, you're developing mechanical systems, you're looking at a whole universe of trades. The totality is all that matters. It's the gut traders that are focused on the individual trade. Can I massage a little more out of this profit? Where do I cry uncle? Before I move you into some trading topics, though, I got to go back to something that you brought up and take you back to the card counting. And also, my understanding, we haven't talked about this, that a certain style of NFL betting, football betting, 
Why don't you speak to the card counting first? I assume the card the card counting was long before there was ever any trading, right? This is that's right. This yes, was re- uh-huh. this was reading beat the dealer and going from there. Lawrence Revere book. Okay, Being okay. Blackjack, playing blackjack as a business. Same deal, though. You said trading 86. When did you start the blackjack direction? Mid-70s. Or at some point, were you just the the fun gambler who went to the casino and would just blow money and you had a, a realization? Or did you always approach it from the, from the mindset of, I'm going to figure this puzzle out? No, I didn't know there was a way to figure out the puzzle. You know, it was, it was like lightning struck in the same way that it did in the... Uh, in the lecture that got me into mechanical trading. Uh, I don't remember how I encountered the book or the concept, but when I did, it was like, okay. It's a big thing, uh, Michael, to take emotion out of anything that you're doing along these lines. Emotion, guts, works in most aspects of business. People's instincts take them far. Somehow, when you're in speculative mode, it's the exact opposite. We're just not wired to be thinking on our feet that way and, and profiting. So when you take emotion out of anything and become robotic and following a methodology, that's where you can just turn yourself around completely. Let me keep asking. I, I just I look. I think the audience would find this fascinating. Most people don't. Re- you know, most people don't go spend their time to figure out the card counting and take it to that level. I mean, did you get did you get to the point where it was making you money? Yeah. But, you know, even then, uh, even though that was kind of like an answer for me, I didn't follow one of the key rules of, like, not getting caught, not playing too long. There is an addictiveness in my personality, too, unfortunately. So I got barred from about a half dozen hotels, and it just became obvious as time went on that this wasn't going to be an answer. Okay, let me shift you to the football because we haven't talked about that. We haven't even talked about the we haven't talked about the blackjack either, but I'm curious about the football and the quant methods. When did this unfold? How did this unfold? That came out of another not mechanical approach, but uh, it was a way of betting technically rather than fundamentally. I, I was without the the gambling. I'm not a fan. Okay. Uh, today, you don't you don't, you don't care about football. You were just strictly strictly in this for. Can I figure out the puzzle and can I win? Right. This Al O'Donnell would put out uh, what was called the point spread playbook, and he'd put out a version every year. And the stats were were how teams would perform against the line. First of all, you know, most of the time people aren't worried about against the line, but that's really all what it's all about if you're gambling. And under what circumstances did the teams win or lose against the line? For example, against the conference, against the division, interconference, on grass, on turf, as home underdogs, as visiting favorites, as home favorites. You get the idea. So that's kind of a technical approach to that. I don't know if I came out ahead overall. You do have to overcome like, uh, I forget what the edge is, probably f- close to 5%. It's much b- bigger than like a blackjack edge you can enjoy. Trading the lines, that football experience, let's bring you into current day where most of your passion is. But trading the lines, trading the price, what's the difference? Trading the lines versus trading the price. I'm not sure I understand. Well, I mean, tra- trading the lines, the lines, the football lines back in the day, using the the technical information to trade the lines versus trading the price today. I mean, it's not fundamental. Yeah, I th- exactly. I think they're both technical approaches, means by which you get your emotion out of the way. But I mean, talk about the feelings. I mean, look, you've got these these varied experiences coming together. You've got the blackjack, you've got the, the, the football from a technical perspective, the trading, it's all in the same headspace. You know, it's all, it's all there. Speak to that connective thinking in your own mind where it all starts to become a way to keep the human biases at bay. Okay. My friend, Bob Pardo had a great quote from uh, one of my books. If you could find that something worked, why wouldn't you want to know it? You know, on the flip side of that, if you you knew that it didn't work, why wouldn't you want to know that? We invest a lot of emotion 
in uh, devising these methodologies, sometimes we have to give them up. It's just because it becomes a situation where you're throwing good money after bad. Yeah, my mindset was, I want this to work. I don't want to be a fan. You know, I don't want to be a cowboy trader. I don't want to be a genius. I just want it to work. If I can find a pathway that demonstrates that it should work, and, you know, you're never going to find something that's going to be absolute, you don't know when you're just going to, you know, the short run is going to do something very unexpected that you can't handle. You never know that for sure, but you can mitigate the loss, the risk rather. If that pathway exists, why wouldn't you spend all the time necessary to make it work? I mean, look, look what you can get if you make it work for yourself. You can avoid, you know, being in some of the most unpleasant situations on earth in different jobs or whatever. Why wouldn't you devote that kind of time? It's your own time. It's your own pace. Why wouldn't you? As we tear apart the idea of the human biases and talking of emotion, I should relay someone texted me the other day and they just said something I don't recall ever hearing from this person before. Maybe they did text me, but they said, Michael. These cryptocurrencies are awesome. I'm up 75,000 since the last time I spoke to you. And and I just started kind of like chuckling to myself. I'm like, you know, are you really think you've figured out the, the holy grail and somehow or another because there's a crazy boom bull in cryptocurrencies that it won't end up going the exact? I mean, you would look when you hear that, what's your immediate thought? Uh, maybe that's the most unluckiest thing that happened to him, right? <laughs> maybe should have started out losers or something. Yeah, right. Because it it does. And what happens though too is you start to believe the uh, the headlines, huh? Right. Exactly. Your own press. Let's talk about data mining. You know, when so many people approach systems, and we talked earlier about the the S and P system that you had, we. Uh, bringing up diversification as a way to to get past uh, trading. You know, one market alone. So many folks out there, and look, I'm not talking about JP Morgan that can do, you know, high frequency trading and they're going to make money every day. I mean, that's not something mere mortals can do. We don't have that access, et cetera. But there is a problem with data mining these days where so many folks can take their trade station or whatever other program and they can just, without having any basic economic sound philosophy as to what the strategy is possibly doing and where it's pulling its edge from, folks just create these optimized type systems and it looks great on paper and they just roll into the markets with it, don't they? Yeah. It's much easier to create really eye-popping results in your performance summary than it is to create something that's robust and pretends well into your actual trading. Give my audience some education for those folks that want to hear Art Collins' view of robustness. I think that if you test under what I call the the four rules of uh, prudent testing, four four rules of uh, optimization, optimization being the study of variables, you know, on all trading platforms, you can type in a, a low number and a high number and an increment in between. For example, closing averages or whatever, and then get results one on top of the other. You can compare and contrast. Well, all right, the first rule of uh, optimization would tell you not to settle necessarily on your best result if it's a diamond in the rough. You know, if you're looking at a X day average and it's 15 is the best out of, you know, you test from two to 50. 15 is the best, but 14 is is a loser. 16 so-so. You don't want to settle on 15. You want to go to 25, which is your second best, because 24 is also good. 23 is reasonably good. 26 is reasonably good. You don't want a diamond in the rough. Okay. Uh, second thing is you want your uh, strategy to test well in other markets, particularly related ones. I would never trust a um, 
barn burning S and P system, you know, that did nothing in the Dow, for example. Uh, third rule would be what we talked about earlier. You don't want your results to be bunched up in a limited uh, time frame. Of course, there's going to be losing periods, even among the, the best of systems. But you want your your winning results to be spread more or less evenly. And then the last one is the last one is you know when I did my uh, market beaters book on mechanical systems, I asked everybody pretty much the same questions, and one of them was. Do you, if you just saw really good numbers, would that be enough to satisfy you? Or do you want to know what you're testing for going in? I thought maybe some people would, you know, they're, they're, you'd get answers on both sides of that equation. That was pretty naive. Everybody to an individual said they want to uh, be testing in support of certain concepts that they understand about the market. You know, whether you're talking momentum or like in the indices, mean reversion. And and that step will keep you out of, you know, sometimes things that are deceptive that get by you are not readily apparent. You mitigate that possibility by saying, okay, I, I've done this long enough to know the market has this characteristic. Let's test this idea in support of it. If you follow those four rules, you're probably not in too much danger of data mining or curve fitting or cherry picking. As we're chatting, and you just mentioned the Market Beaters book, and I have I have to apologize. You, you're so kind to send me two of your books while I'm in Asia, and then I actually brought them with me to the States. So they have had quite the, uh, quite the journey, you know, or all, all basically around the world to this interview. But as I was thinking about the Market Beaters book, there's a great story in there that I would love for you to relay uh, about Bill Dunn early in his career. And he's sharing with, I think it was a potential investor, a potential partner, sharing with that person the results of his trend following system. And these results uh, were not, you know, 10% a year. I mean, this was, uh, you know, higher reward, higher, re higher risk type trading. Why do you share that? Uh, Cause I think, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a huge story, but it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, it early on to, to watch uh, someone like uh, Bill Dunn, one of the pioneers, one of the, frankly, uh, one of the legends of trading, even though he's not as well known as a Warren Buffett, I mean, his he's right there. Why don't you share that story? That's a great story. Uh, he was talking about basically somebody was saying, uh, uh, "Look, th those performance numbers are just too big. You got to dial it back." Essentially, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I mean, Richard Dennis said something similar. Uh, he was trying to get a fund going uh, where he could really put the pedal to the metal and get some really great returns but he was losing people because the risk was too high they could they couldn't take you know the necessary string of losses to get to that level so yeah there's a, there's a huge difference between working for yourself and coming up with a methodology that works and selling something to the public let's take that apart for a second because i think it's really interesting what you just said you said you know they couldn't sell the the way you used risk, the way you just used risk, and I know you didn't mean it this way. I, I do the same thing. We're we're sitting here saying, well, you know, essentially, uh, what Bill Dunn and what Rich Dennis were offering, what you know, had more risk was risky. I don't really think, in their heart of hearts, they believe that. No, they believed that in the in the the long term was going to reward them, but the problem was people couldn't hang on for the journey to get to that long term result. You know, so there's two different understandings of risk. Yeah, right. And that's 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 why Rich Dennis is Rich Dennis, and that's why Bill Dunn is who Bill Dunn is. And back to back to your point and what Bob Pardo was saying, if there is a way that it works, wouldn't everybody want to know the way that it works? But art. You and I both know most people don't want to know how it works. 
They don't, they don't want, to want to be bothered. They want to look at the S. They want to look at the S. P. <laughs> in 2017 and say, Art Collins, Mike Covell, I don't care what you're saying. I'm rich. Yeah, you, na- you nailed <laughs> I mean, it, Mike. It's true. It's true, though. But I, I love yeah. the I, I love the idea, especially too, when people will, you know, they they might talk about, uh, you know, again, we'll use Rich Dennis and Bill Dunn. People would say, some critics would say over the years, oh my gosh, look at their sharp ratio. I can never trade them. And yet, well, hold on. Why are we assuming the sharp ratio is measuring anything that's really important to us, especially not measuring something like a trend following strategy well? You know? Right. Let me shift you, Art. Let me shift. Let me go to consistency. So many people, when they think about systems, they want to kind of be like Bernie Madoff almost. They want to imagine that they can make a certain amount of money each month. Or a certain amount of money each day. Let me make a thousand dollars a day. Art Collins, why can I not make a thousand dollars a day? That seems like a simple goal. It does, doesn't it? It's very, uh, very seductive. That was, uh, I think, one of my intros. I forget which book. I believe it was Market Beaters. Because people would tell me I can make a thousand dollars a day. Uh, a, a very uh, effective uh, pit trader that I knew. Uh, was telling me that and i'm like well so what do you do are you shooting for three thousand dollars to cover you know your inevitable losing days and and how big are your losses on the losing days are they are you holding it to 500 or is it more like two thousand dollars to make a thousand or this or that and he was basically now you can just you can just see you can just get out when you're wrong and you know gobbledygook uh Maybe it did work for him. I don't know. But it, 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 he wasn't giving me parameters that I could work with. You're going to have to accept losing trades and losing days. So what do you make to get $1,000 a day? And I, and I came up with a bunch of hypotheticals and, you know, wound up being probably have to trade really big to make 1000 a day. Because, I mean, you could break it down into, uh, well, you better have four winning days uh, where you can make. 1200 and only one losing day where you lose 800 or you you know you better have one day where it's a runaway 4500 and it'll offset three or four thousand or whatever you, you know what i'm saying you, you can't do the thousand dollars a day without having parameters for the win and the loss side that's going to get you there but people just assume well every day i'm going to find that optimal trade that's going to make a thousand dollars not possible not possible if you don't have parameters that are going to get you there they want that smooth perfect return right what's going on in our mind that we even think something like this is possible when we come to the markets i mean almost nothing about the life of us human beings is smooth or perfect but then we go to the markets and we think, oh my gosh, it should be easy to just make $1,000 a day. We should just have perfect returns forever going on ad, ad infinitum. It doesn't stop. Where do we go wrong? Wish fulfillment, a reluctance to do the hard work, not facing reality. Why, why do traders have an instinct to hang on to their losses, hoping that they're going to come back, but getting out of profits quickly? So that they can feel relief, you know, that they've rung the cash register and it's not going to get away from them. Why is that our instinct when, you know, trading 101 tells you it has to be the exact opposite? You have to let your profits run, cut your losses short. Humans are just not wired to instinctively trade good. You know, it's the rare individual that, you know, that can do that. The profit target is seductive. Mm Mm-hmm. Let me go in and I'm up, you know, I'm up a certain amount of money and let me just take it off the, let me take it off the table and I've got it now. I can hold on to it and I will just as easily be able to come back the next day, reset, play it again, scalp it off, take it. And then we just extrapolate out and say, I could do this every day. Exactly. <laughs> it just doesn't. Good luck. <laughs> Let's talk, let's, talk, let's talk a little about simple versus complex. Why don't you put your best professorial hat on? Because, you know, a lot of us in uh, modern life, I mean, we, you know, I can look at an iPhone sitting in front of me and it's a 
a terribly complex little device. It operates quite simply, but it's terribly complex. But in the markets, lots of moving parts, lots of gears, complexity when it comes to a systematic trading approach. This is not how the best do it. That doesn't mean that the thinking and the rationales and the philosophies behind a good quant trader or quant firm are not complex or, or not very sophisticated, but the, the actual operation. Simple beats complex. Why don't you explain to folks why that is? If something is really complex, it's probably the result of you going back in history and targeting individual trades that are going to be losses. You know, you, you, you look at what led up to a giant loss over here and you notice one market aspect. So you make a rule that eliminates that. Then you'll go to another point, see another loss. You make another rule. The more rules you make, the more likely it is that you're over-optimizing. Even when you're creating an effective system, the, the raw underlying uh, market aspects are the most statistically reliable. And as you refine a system, you may be doing it correctly and it may be necessary to get the numbers up where you need them, but you have to understand as you're doing it, you're automatically lessening the statistical reliability. To paraphrase George Orwell, few rules good, many rules bad. I like it. I like it. And, you know, look, there's there's no one perfect way to do things. You've mentioned two different types of quant systems in this conversation. We've kind of mentioned trend following. You mentioned mean reversion. There's probably other styles that you and I don't know exactly about. I think what's nice about those particular styles that I just mentioned, folks can go find some of the names that we've mentioned on this podcast, you can look at the historical performance of practitioners and you can draw some confidence from that performance data. Even if you don't know how that performance data was generated yet, you can look at it and you can say to yourself, wow, how did Dennis do that? How did Pardo do that? How did Dunn do that? Meaning if all you've got is their performance track record, it becomes a puzzle to reverse engineer it to the best extent that you can. Right. It's a good exercise, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I, I, do, I do an exercise uh, where you uh, develop a charlatan system by, you know, that kind of reverse engineering. And, you know, when you get these flyers in the mail, I made 2,700% in the S&Ps over the last three years, blah, blah, blah. Technically, those people might not be lying. Technically, if you followed that exact set of rules, you would have gotten that exact result had you, you know, been clairvoyant and known ahead of time. Because all they did was create a picture-perfect representation of the past. It's meaningless. You know, I've got, I'm in the uh, Virginia area right now visiting family, and I saw a cousin of mine in his early 40s, and he showed me a newspaper article of a guy that grew up in the Virginia area where we are, and he was in his late 30s running a hedge fund, and it turned out to be a Ponzi scheme, and he basically stole $9 million. And I saw a snippet of his track record for like the last four years, and it was essentially every month was like 1.23%, 1.5%, basically 1% to 2% each month. And he sprinkled in a couple, you know, 3 or 4% months and maybe a couple down months in four years. But basically, he was saying, I made this small amount of consistent money each month. And right there, isn't that the charlatan giveaway? Yeah. You know? Or, or you know, you, you make a, uh, a ridiculously high percentage, you know? Dead giveaway that something is up. Exactly. You know? That expression, if it's too good to be true is very true. <laughs> Art, folk, folks are going to have to go check you out. I'm holding two of your books in front of me, Market Beaters and Beating the Financial Futures Market, Combining Small Biases into Powerful Money-Making Strategies. I don't know how many Art Collins books there are. There's more than two. Oh, there's four, but um, the, the um, Beating the Financial Futures Market has just been re-released. The, the rights reverted to me, and you know I'm, I'm doing well with it. It's an 11-year-old book. Surprisingly, 
Well, maybe I shouldn't say surprisingly, but there's there's several strategies in that book that I devised myself that have been holding up in 11-year real time in all five of the uh, index markets. I'm probably going to put out a supplement to that book in the near future, just showing the, how it's been doing lately as well as some new ideas. Well, I've always, I've also, I've always been a big fan of market beaters as well. Like I said, you know, you you really, you really cover some of several folks that have been on this podcast, but some great information in there. Hey, Art, where's the best place we can send people? Where's the best website that folks can go to check you out, connect with you, etc. ArtCollinsTrading.com. Easy enough. Mm -hmm. Or you know, I'm I'm on Amazon too. When is the next book coming, or is it coming, or have you retired from the book of stuff? Full book? I'm not sure yet. The uh, addendum to uh, the uh, beating the financial futures market should be out within a month or two. ArtCollinsTrading.com, easily found. Art, thank you for taking some time today. Great talking to you, Michael. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.